person who really gave me my first exposure uh, to, to climate change, and he gave me my first exposure to the polar regions. Uh, he was the one who allowed me to reach out and, and really touch the, the epicenter of the changes that are happening uh, in this world today. And that was in 2009. But a lot has changed since 2009. We uh, stumbled through a disastrous Copenhagen summit. Uh, I suppose we haven't really fully recovered from that yet, still a bit hungover. Um, we had the hottest year on record recently. We had then another hottest year on record right after it. Uh, and just last month, we had uh, probably the hottest April on record. Um, and we've also seen the emergence of new fields of, of economic thinking, new fields of research that uh, are not afraid to cross the, the borders and the barriers of um, the previous traditional ways of thinking about, um, about research. And meanwhile, we've seen the emergence of uh, many new economic studies that try to harness this interdisciplinary work. Um, economic studies that are telling us lots of different things. We have the Risky Business Report that was uh, very recent, a year or two ago maybe, tells us to expect hundreds of billions of dollars in costs and disruptions uh, by 2030. The Economist Intelligence Unit tells us to expect if uh, business as usual scenario holds uh, more than $10 trillion in private sector losses. We even have reports pushing the private sector to take this more seriously from a risk standpoint. Uh, Mercer Investments, um, part of a very, very large consulting and, and risk management company, uh, warned of the destabilization of certain asset classes. Now, since that first trip with, with Rob, uh, I've done three expeditions to the North Pole. I led a research expedition to the South Pole. Uh, and as I have become more and more involved in the research component of this, and and this takes time because I'm young and not super credible at this stage, um, uh, just starting my, my PhD next year. But as I've become more and more involved in this, I've realized that the, the discourse among experts has become much more panicked. Um, every year it gets more panicked. As the projections get worse and worse, um, we watch as the diplomatic process continues to sort of fail around us, and even the minor victories seem to never really uh, get a foothold and so today I'd like to talk about three things that I think we need more of in our, uh, in our fight against climate change. And then I'm going to talk about two things that have nothing to do with um, the technical components, but I do think are equally essential. And so the first thing I'd like to, to, to say or to talk about is that I, I believe we need more mission specialists. Um, you know, climate change is probably the most unique economic challenge that is based entirely in uh, natural systems that I think we've ever faced. And some of the most influential research has come out of people who are really not afraid to cross traditional disciplinary boundaries. The risky business report that I mentioned earlier, for example, is based on a new field of research um, in econometrics, which is trying to take uh, enormous amounts of data from climate shifts and apply them to understanding how we can statistically understand economic changes. Um, and at the same time, traditional economists can't, are not trained to do that. Uh, traditional climate scientists are not trained to do that. I, my degree at Yale is geology and geophysics, and uh, we're not trained to do anything like that. We, we barely do any statistics, in fact. I think the second thing that I would like to see more of in the coming years is investment in the highly specialized tools that these researchers, this new generation of researchers, needs to be using. And what I mean by that is, Funding climate econometrics, funding energy system sciences, funding uh, grid modeling, funding um, market innovations that allow us to come up with financial instruments that can generate revenue for clean energy infrastructure, for energy efficiency, for lots of different programs to reduce emissions. And it also means that we have to prioritize the development of partnerships between the academic community and the private sector uh, to rapidly deploy and scale these solutions even though that makes a lot of researchers really deeply uncomfortable, especially the older ones. They want to stay in the lab. They want to be completely um, completely removed from the application. But that's no longer something that I think is sustainable or even acceptable. And I also believe, lastly, that the US and Europe should invest uh, much more time and energy into understanding how we can reduce emissions separately from the power generation issue. Because as Rob talked about being relevant, and um, 
the role of developing, developing economies, we're still seeing a lot of pressure on developing nations to come to the table and make emissions cuts that they're not ready to make. Because for the foreseeable future, economic growth and energy use are still in lockstep in these nations. And if we're gonna have a chance at easing the burden on these economies, if we're gonna have a chance at uh, coming together, fulfilling our obligations to one another in an international policy context, I think it's really critical to make sure that we can deploy tools like higher technology energy efficiency. That will allow uh, countries like India to, that are not necessarily ready to move to clean energy um, straight away or on a large scale to ease their burden and to continue to fulfill their commitments. Now all of this falls into the technical realm of, of, um, of I guess, solutions or propositions and you may agree with me, you may disagree with me, you may think it's complete garbage or you might just be completely asleep because I didn't talk about uh, my expedition to the South Pole. Um, but I think at the same time, there are two things that I maintain are equally important that have nothing to do with um, the research, or nothing to do with even policy. Um, and one of them is hope that Rob talked about, and another one is empathy. And I'm really glad that Rob talk, talked about hope because I think many of us are starting to sense that there's a fear of losing control that the world that we want to build, or at least that we can foresee when, we're, when we get down to policy discussions, uh, is slipping away from us. And that's a really terrifying thing. Now, I'm about to spend the next five years in school, and I'm probably going to continue to do my research afterwards, but I have to think about what is my day-to-day -day job going to be like 10 years from now? Is it going to be sitting at my desk and just generating increasingly dire versions of the exact same report every five years? Because I really don't want that to happen, I think I'm just going to be really bored if that does happen. But I think at the same time that we have an opportunity to harness increasingly sophisticated tools to give this challenge the response it deserves. And so I don't think that being optimistic is naive. You know, when I was in Antarctica and we were walking to the South Pole, being overly optimistic was probably the only thing that got me through the day, that allowed me to take one step at a time in the most chaotic conditions on the planet. And so I don't think that I'm as perturbed by the pace of UN negotiations as maybe I could be, or maybe others could be. Because it's easy to despair, but I do feel strongly that if we maintain a sense of ambition and curiosity and creativity and innovation in all of the things that we do, that we will get there and we will find that we see results. And it's only that we actually lose this hope that we really do actually lose the control that we fear that we're gonna lose. And so I, I really hope that we hold on to, to hope uh, no matter what, the, what happens with um, UN discussions or, or the ratification of the Paris Agreement or whatever, because I think without it we are lost. And secondly, I believe that we need to reconsider the role of empathy. Uh, people say the world is very small. Uh, I actually completely disagree. Um, I think that we have forgotten how large the world is. And the reason I say that is because it's very, very difficult to fundamentally relate to the experiences of many people around us that grew up in completely different circumstances. It's easy to forget that climate change is first and foremost an issue of inequality, that it is first and foremost a threat to the rights and the opportunities of the poor. And it's even easier to forget that most of us here will never, ever be able to relate to being that vulnerable, to have absolutely nothing. And then because of the actions, or lack thereof, of um, rich people very, very far away on the other side of the world, to have a disruption that you really, really cannot afford imposed upon you from above to have your, your sense of agency, um, any sort of control over your future, uh, uh, your sense of self-determination to be torn from you. And since most of us in this room today cannot actually relate to that experience, I think that's one of the reasons it's become exceedingly difficult for those of us that have contributed contributed to causing this problem to prioritize solving it. Earlier this year, I was working on a, um, a climate economics project. It was a few researchers from three or four different universities. 
and I was trying to look at how different flood patterns affected different populations in Bangladesh um, and how the changes in those flood patterns as the climate changed uh, were going were gonna to change their vulnerability to, uh, to these floods. And uh, I was trying to run an, a code uh, to analyze some of the underlying statistics behind this data set. We were looking at a, a very large data set, maybe more than 3 million uh, people from survey data. And there was a bug, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And so I went into the underlying data set, and I took a look at what was going on. I wanted to see if it was maybe a formatting issue or something. And something very strange happened when I was doing this. And that is that one by one and, and row by row, I started to get to know the stories of the people who were a part of the survey. And that was a strange experience um, because there's a lot of information in this. One row is a person in this data set. And uh, for a hypothetical Mr. X, I would know that he's 46 years old, and I would know that he has two children, and one of them has been disabled since a young age, and I would know that he is a rickshaw driver, and I would know that um, he makes X dollars a day, and I would know everything about his life. I would know who makes the decisions in the household. I would know exactly what kind of rice he buys. And that was a, a very strange experience because in the section of the data set that I was looking at, by far the most common profession uh, that I saw was rock collector. And for those of you that, don't, that are not aware of this, um, these are the poorest of the poor people in, in Bangladesh. They are those who uh, spend their days lugging extremely heavy uh, rocks, boulders, um, to be ground up and mixed into cement to be used for building materials. They get paid pennies. Um, and even unlike the, the farmers that are, that are poor and don't make much money, uh, they don't have any land to subsist on. They can't just grow their own food. And so they're even more vulnerable. And this experience really floored me because we have a tendency to throw around these big statistics, We're talking about billions and trillions of dollars. I did it myself for the first half of this, this talk. And I'd forgotten that among all of the acrimony and the the identity politics that characterizes the Western response to this debate, that what was lying underneath it was still a humanitarian crisis. And when a humanitarian crisis lurks, we tend to become desensitized to the stories of individual people. And it's easy to forget this. And so this is why I believe that a deep emotional involvement in our work um, and an emotional attachment to the success of our work is critical. And if we can combine highly technical, rigorous, interdisciplinary, innovative research with, at the core, a combination of hope and empathy and remembering the people that are on the other end of this, that are not in the room, not at the, not the negotiating table, then perhaps we stand a good chance of, of solving this problem. Um, thank you very much, and uh, please have a great rest of your conference.